Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying on. I am the last uh, presentation for this session, so I try to be concise. And first of all, I'm certainly uh, I'm honored to be in this panel uh, among many uh, distinguished uh, scholars on BRI. Uh, and thanks to uh, IEMS uh, for hosting this. Uh, I think this is a tremendously uh, important uh, research area given the scope uh, and the scale of, of BRI. My background is epidemiology and, uh, and global health uh, infectious diseases. And I just joined uh, RAND last year, uh, especially with a group of researchers uh, that including economists, uh, pol um, policy analysts uh, on this uh, study of BRI. So RAND Corporation is a nonpartisan uh, and a nonprofit uh, research institute uh, you know, headquartered in California, uh, just so if anyone's not familiar with it. Um, so I would start with uh, the, this is a teamwork uh, that we have published recently uh, of a working paper uh, of demystifying the BRI. Uh, and in this paper, we try to uh, analyze uh, the characteristic of BRI, how it's different from other uh, infrastructure or energy uh, projects in the world. Uh, and uh, I want to highlight my co-authors, uh, uh, Dr. Dasani, uh, who's an economist and uh, director of the uh, CAP, uh, the uh, Center for Asia Pacific Policy, and our uh, expert researcher, uh, Karen Zhu, uh, that has been working with us on this. So this year, we certainly see the converge uh, of the two large issues uh, that with my background with uh, global health have become a little bit more relevant. Um, so I will start with a, a very brief overview of BRI uh, at the stage seven years after its, its inception and uh, a little bit on the COVID-19 on BRI. It certainly has been uh, explored uh, by our uh, fellow panelists. Um, and then I'll focus more on the, uh, China's global health activities and it's morphed into the health Silk Road. And finally, we want to talk about some of the public policy issues, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So as many of us have already talked about, this is the uh, world's largest development fi uh, fi finance uh, in initiative. So I highlighted some statistics and, and uh, probably familiar uh, images uh, to many of you uh, that there are um, about uh, 500 uh, projects, probably more uh, out there, but primarily these uh, projects are in Asia Pacific, uh, Central Asia and Middle East. And we talked about the characteristics of uh, of the BRI, one of them is global connectivity. And that's been amplified by the, uh, the CR Express uh, projects that really links Asia to Europe. And uh, the national level infrastructure building is highlighted um, by one of the uh, projects in, in Africa, which is in Kenya from the uh, railway uh, railroad from uh, Mombasa to Nairobi is one of the, uh, the biggest uh, infrastructure uh, that's in that country since the country's independence. And finally, the uh, Pakistan uh, uh, economic corridor certainly shows that it's a comprehensive uh, development. And so uh, in our report, we also mentioned some of the success uh, as well as uh, some of the uh, challenges for BRI. Uh, and I, I won't go into details, um, but you know, I would like to highlight one of the success that actually was reported by uh, the uh, 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 South China Morning Post uh, just two days ago about the CR Express, uh, the railroad from Asia linking 60, country, uh, 60 cities in China and uh, 50 cities in Europe. And that uh, railroad has been very successful this year. Uh, they, they have seen the number of train rides 
uh, increased uh, 40% um, by July, uh, that carrying a lot of the medical and remote working uh, 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 products that as the demand surges. So that's one of the successful story, I guess, for, uh, uh, for China and many of these partner countries. And the challenges uh, are also plenty, but some of them are, uh, I, I would not be surprised uh, that given the scale and the focus of the BRI. Some of the challenges such as the partner countries have increasing debts uh, and increasing reliance on China that given the scale of the infrastructure building and energy uh, 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 power plants, those are uh, not uh, surprising if we're investing in these uh, infrastructures. And uh, some of these, uh, mo most of these projects are infrastructure large scale that really targeting a long term uh, gains, not necessarily short term profits. So that probably explains some of the, the lack of short term gains so far. And uh, I think many of our panelists have talked about the different governing styles and the questions on the transparency and the co corruption pro uh, issues that are uh, uh, plenty there. Um, and I would also mention the diversity of the investment, although the, one of the characteristics of BRI is it's state-owned, uh, state-financed, and state-implemented. Um, um, but it also, we see increasing private sector investment, as we m mentioned just now by, by Albert. And geopolitics is also important. Whether these infrastructures and ports and uh, uh, transit lines uh, can be used for security uh, and strategy, especially the armed force, those are, have been uh, in the discussion. So with that background, uh, the COVID-19 hits this year unexpectedly. Uh, so the COVID-19 really causes all countries to re-examine their health and public health systems uh, and think about their medical supply chains and probably reflecting more on the globalization and impact of their, uh, and its impact on their domestic health securities. And we have mentioned earlier uh, in the panel, there are, there are some uh, near-term uh, slowdowns in 2020 and probably spill over to next year. Uh, and we see that uh, partly from the domestic, I mean, Chinese domestic economic fallout, especially not, not necessarily for the large manufacturing sectors, but probably more for service uh, and SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. And so certainly there are, influenced by the uh, change the global supply chains uh, and of course the US China trade war and the some of these uh, technology sanctions also affects uh, the government's decisions. Um, and so we'll, we'll be not be surprised to see that there was some focus coming inwards to more of domestic consumptions and also the development uh, in the uh, domestic markets. Then the overseas factors, including uh, this, uh, some of the slowdown of the project during COVID-19, when it's at peak of the epidemic in different countries. Uh, and the travel restrictions certainly uh, putting additional barriers uh, to some of these projects. So some of the Chinese uh, technicians and managers cannot travel overseas now, and they have to also think about local, more local hiring during this period, and that can slow down the projects. And also the global medical supply shortage uh, highlights some of the barriers uh, for the projects. So what are the responses so far we have seen? Uh, so some of these responses I get uh, is from uh, the announcement after this uh, mid-June uh, conference in Beijing, uh, where the BRI conference uh, relates to, uh, including uh, the United Nations uh, agencies, as well as about maybe 20 ministers from different countries uh, to talk about the future of BRI. So some of the responses are abstract from there. So certainly, as uh, my panelist uh, has just mentioned uh, earlier, that there will be definitely a continuation of BRI 
um, but the focus might be uh, switched a little bit. So the focus on infrastructure will continue, but now uh, the wording changes to more on the high quality, on the cost sharing, uh, on the profit sharing, as well as uh, to the focus on facilitating the industrial industrialization of the participating countries. So we see, do see there's more emphasis, at least in the words, on the quality uh, and uh, the, uh, the local needs. There's certainly more focus on the connectivity uh, for global supply chain given the recent uh, crisis. Um, and then the next three, uh, next two points probably more relates to the COVID uh, uh, challenges. And one is uh, building green channels uh, for international travel and supply chain uh, logistics. So that would probably would be seen as one of the upcoming priorities. And it also focused on the economic recovery, um, both domestic and global. And uh, it especially highlights the uh, supporting for the tourist, tourism and uh, the service sectors, uh, mainly uh, dominated by the small and medium uh, enterprises. And and certainly there's collaboration on health sector, which I will explore a bit more later on, and on the education job trainings. And they restate their support to the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement, I think in a part of the efforts of continue to engage uh, the UN and international um, partners. So now I will focus more on the health uh, Silk Road. Uh, so I think in, similar to many other projects in uh, BRI, uh, the China's government usually use a existing uh, project or foundations and morph them into uh, the project under BRI and giving it uh, BRI's characteristics. So I don't think the health uh, support or global health activities in China is really new. Uh, I gave a testimony last year uh, in July about the same time uh, to the Congress about China's global health activities. So we can see that it's really going back uh, in the 1960s. Uh, 1963 was the first time that China sent out a medical team to Algeria and uh, later on it becomes this partnership between a province in China and a country usually is in uh, uh, developing country in Africa or uh, Asia uh, that creating these uh, uh, sort of a, a demand and uh, a supply of uh, some of these medical teams. The medical facility building is also has been has a long history uh, and usually it, this actually uh, goes up a little bit in the recent years, but it has uh, a, a long uh, history of that. Um, the medical supplies, medical donations, medicine donations peaked uh, in around year 2010 and 2012. Um, at the time, uh, China actually, actually uh, export a lot of medicine on, especially on anti-malaria uh, medicine. But then it hit a wall in some of the backlashes due to the quality quality and uh, regulations on this medicine. So that has been slowing down before the BRI and now we probably see another uh, efforts on that. And finally, the health professional training and the humanitarian aid has also been ongoing. Uh, China has sent the largest humanitarian uh, medical team uh, to West Africa during the Ebola uh, epidemic uh, in 2014 and 16. So this report is, uh, I put out the link here, it's a public uh, available report just like our BRI working paper uh, on the RAND uh, uh, website. So as you can see that China do have a ongoing global health activity and uh, the health Silk Road, uh, that term specifically was uh, uh, came out in 2017, uh, January 2017, when uh, President Xi signed an MOU with WHO uh, in Geneva uh, to improve the public health uh, along the BRI countries. Later that year in August in Beijing, there were about 40 uh, health ministers from uh, BRI countries uh, and for, uh, set up this forum on uh, health collaborations. 
But so far, we haven't seen a lot of uh, emphasis, focus on, on, on this uh, effort. I think partly because, you know, uh, as my panelists had mentioned, that uh, the focus of BRI is really uh, on the infrastructure and energy and uh, connections. Um, but uh, this term came out again this year in March uh, when uh, President Xi has in this phone call with Italian Prime Minister uh, and talking about uh, medical and health uh, support uh, to Italy. And this term health socorro came up again. So, so far, uh, the criticism on the, or the concerns about China's global health so far has always been that this has been very fragmented. Uh, it's not well coordinated and the impact of individual projects are uh, questionable. And, uh, you know, the, basically it, it doesn't have a lot of impact uh, globally, but they, that might change. So um, what, what I have seen in the last few years uh, is that China is trying to very hard to uh, put these very fragmented uh, projects on global health, put, link them together. So we see that some of the um, screening program, for example, on heart, uh, congenital heart diseases in Cambodia, the cancer research, uh, cancer screening, stroke uh, st screening program are increasingly uh, tie into the hospital building. So usually a hospital or ho a clinic is built, uh, and then that will become the base for these training programs uh, and uh, becoming the, uh, the research uh, base uh, for that. Um, and then there's also an emphasis, certainly on technology, using AI and cloud imaging and cloud computing, machine learning uh, to deal with the images. Uh, you know, one of the project I observed was the uh, cervical cancer uh, screening in uh, Laos, Cambodia, and that allows the local re uh, the physicians to upload some of the image of, on cervical cancer and then uh, getting uh, more instructions and uh, information uh, through remote uh, medicine. So these are the trends. So we're seeing an increasingly uh, coordinated efforts and certainly centralized uh, state funded efforts. Now, after COVID, um, the, again, back in June, in this, uh, so, uh, the uh, Belt and Road uh, Conference uh, in mid June, uh, Hell Silk Road become a important. Uh, topic actually, it took about one third of the statement uh, afterwards. Uh, so in this one, I see the most uh, the, the uh, contents most focus on a strategy. It seems that a strategy on Hell Silk Road is coming out. Uh, so if a focus on uh, three or four uh, themes. One is uh, building the public health capacity, which is not surprising given. Uh, the challenge uh, faced by the COVID, uh, by the uh, global challenges. And the other one is more touching on the global health governance, uh, which is building the regional, global, as well as the bilateral pandemic response mechanism. This is really uh, sounds very similar to the, the, to the global health uh, strategies that after Ebola, after the U.S. has uh, pr proposed after Ebola. And uh, there's also an emphasis on the medical supplies uh, and vaccine becomes a uh, keywords here. So we all know that China has eight uh, COVID vaccines in the human trials now. Uh, so China may well be the, one of the first countries that uh, pr producing uh, a successful vaccine. And what is the Im implication of that uh, to the world? So that would be uh, interesting to see whether BRI will, will absorb that. Uh, and finally, the remote medicine, as I mentioned before, uh, has been highlighted again. So in general, the summary 
summary of the uh, sort of a BRI 2.0 uh, focusing on the health Silk Road and digital Silk Road come down to four areas. One is the medical uh, technology. Uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine would be one of them. Genetic and synthetic biology uh, would be uh, more uh, in addition to that. Uh, digital applications of technology uh, in the application to public health, like the health code uh, used by uh, used in the COVID-19 and a surveillance system will be part of that. Uh, and remote uh, consultation, medical consultation that uh, amplified by the Alley Health and, uh, you know, Ping An Good Doctors are also another platform they're emphasizing. And finally, the smart cities uh, and AI implementations in disease surveillance uh, will uh, be on the table. So that's the most of the contents that's been mentioned by the Health Silk Road. So what is the gain? You know, as for BRI project, we also always want to know what's the gain for China, what's the gain for the uh, recipient countries, and what are the critics uh, outside, you know, this two uh, realm. Uh, so first, the gain for China is obvious uh, that they want to change the narrative of COVID-19 uh, and health governance for China. Uh, so there's certainly a little bit delay in the beginning, but then uh, China has control uh, the contained the virus pretty successfully. So how to narr to help uh, to f form that narrative uh, is important message relate relates to health Silk Road. And also developing a new market uh, on health related products. Uh, so uh, China's using a NRA uh, system that's very different from the uh, most of the, uh, the developed countries uh, system, uh, the FDA system for medicine and vaccine regulations. Uh, and they so far they only have four vaccines uh, being pre-qualified by WHO. So it's still a new um, player uh, in terms of global markets of uh, pharmaceutical products. The most of the products that China exports are APIs that, that, that are the, those are the, um, the basic ingredients, chemicals uh, that's used for uh, pharmaceuticals. So it's very low on the value chain. So th I think this will be an opportunity for China to explore a new market for and go up to the, the supply chain. Uh, soft power certainly is, uh, is there to be building the solidarities with uh, partner countries and countries with uh, geopolitics interest, uh, as well as to start to working with the WHO uh, and other uh, international organizations to shape uh, global governance is probably one of the, uh, the gains. And the gains for the recipient country is also pretty straightforward. Vaccine medical supplies are hot commodities now. Uh, health infrastructure uh, are continue to be, uh, will be necessary. And biological technology transfer is also interesting. Uh, and finally, it's a health uh, system capacity building. Now, what are the critics? Uh, so far, you know, this is uh, the health as uh, the HSR, the Health Silk Road, is still relatively new, but there are still already some uh, critics have voiced some of the concerns. Uh, so whether countries will be more relying on China and enter the China's influence on human rights and geopolitics issues, and whether China will use the uh, medical assistance for pre 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 preferential uh, market access, and what about the quality of the, the medical supplies, and what about the data ownership, uh, if, you know, we're talking about technology and uh, uh, big data sh sharing. And uh, this will be on my last slides. I would pose some challenges uh, to the Health Silk Road. Um, so from my observation of several projects, uh, I found one of the large, biggest challenge is to, again, the effective communications between the, the teams that's conducting uh, these uh, medical support versus the grassroots community at the recipient countries. Often these uh, contracts were made at a government, a higher government level. Um, so the, the support is, uh, provided may not necessarily uh, really targeting the, the urgent needs of the, the community for so 
uh, for now. And then also the health data privacy is certainly a, a, a issue. Uh, and then it was the cross-border business data flows. We really want to see that China probably have to uh, come to discussion with these countries about legislations on these uh, data transfers. Uh, and certainly uh, China will want to uh, raise the issues of uh, pharmaceutical uh, regulations and have to harmonize their regulations with other countries in order to uh, put their products on the market. So with that, I will stop and I'm looking forward for discussions. Thank you, Jennifer. That was very informative. Uh, Yemin, do you want to ask your question or your comment? Uh, Jennifer, this is so wonderful. Uh, I, I, I appreciate and I look forward to reading the, the full document. Uh, since you are at Georgetown, uh, I wonder how this uh, Health Silk Road uh, is uh, in the conversation of Washington geopolitics uh, toward uh, China. Uh, are are the, the Washington people uh, thinking about response? Uh, how likely? Right? Um, because this might be a game changer uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the US-China uh, contestation uh, in the future. Thanks. That's a great, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, I would say there are lots of interest, uh, certainly uh, from the Congress, uh, about uh, China's, uh, 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 I would say, competition or uh, the activities in, in the global health uh, uh, arena. Uh, so I have actually given in the last uh, year, I have given four testimonies on relates to uh, China's uh, global health issues. So the first one was the one that I presented about the history of the global health. Um, but this year, certainly there were three uh, testimony focusing on COVID-19. Uh, so that certainly play into the politics here uh, is, you know, what what is uh, China's ma management of COVID-19 and, uh, you know, how would that play into the geopolitics? Uh, so I think, you know, uh, Washington is certainly uh, look very closely uh, at uh, both BRI and, um, and these global health uh, initiatives. But I would say, you know, so far the, the Health Silk Road is uh, getting a lot less uh, attention compared to other infrastructure uh, projects. I think in a way it's very, uh, financially it's very small and it's probably not mostly uh, profit driven uh, and it's the focus probably is most on the soft power uh, and global governance issues. So Jennifer, I have a I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've we've heard talk of mask diplomacy. You know, where China's trying to help all of these countries deal with COVID. And I'm just wondering, as far as you know, is that working? I mean, uh, does are, are there countries that really feel very positively about China because of the assistance they're getting to deal with COVID, or is it kind of not really an issue, or kind of a well, it depends on which media channel we are looking at, right, that we are hearing from. Um, so there's definitely very uh, mixed, uh, and most of the Western media are uh, portraying a, a much uh, a cynical uh, view of this, uh, talking about the mask diplomacy with uh, string uh, attached, uh, and uh, also the quality of the, the supply. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was uh, joining a panel uh, hosted by the German Marshall uh, Initiative Fund uh, and talk about the Mediterranean uh, countries uh, and uh, the BR, the, their perspective uh, on BRI and also COVID, uh, it seems that for most of the communities, uh, local communities, they uh, certainly welcome uh, the supplies, uh, the supports uh, from China. So maybe it, I, I see this more 
the debate is more at a higher level rather than at a community level. I think the uh, for uh, communities, even you know, in Washington D.C., I uh, we have multiple people that are trying to uh, support uh, the local hospital with uh, Chinese supplies, and no one said no. <laughs> Everyone said everything's needed. You know, uh, everything's welcome. Yeah, and I haven't heard any uh, quality issue uh, issues from these. Uh, communities.